Hi everyone, and welcome to our sermon for Sunday, March 28th. No matter where you are watching from or when you are watching this video, I greet you all with the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This time of social distancing continues to be difficult as we grapple with being unable to visit our family and friends. We are unable to gather for church among the many other social activities we have become so used to engaging in. But during this time of social distancing, I remain ever grateful for technology that is allowing us all to stay connected. I am also so grateful for God's Holy Spirit, which keeps us connected to each other, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and also connected to God himself. In case you haven't had a chance, I encourage you to check out our time of prayer, which was uploaded on YouTube this past week. Keep watching for those midweek times of prayer as we center ourselves on the one who sustains us. Our Sunday school teachers are also working to get some young children and worship stories recorded, so watch our YouTube channel for those. And finally, we have put links on our Facebook page to some worship songs that Lee, our music director at Westwood, had originally chosen for this Sunday. So I encourage you to check out all of these things as we seek to stay connected as a congregation in worshipful ways during this time of social distancing. Today we continue our journey through the wilderness this Lenten season. We continue to follow the lectionary, the readings recommended to the church for this Sunday. And today, I particularly wanted to share with you the reading from the Gospel of John. And today we will be reading from chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. And it says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, and then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, 
your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached that place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. Thanks be to God for his word to us today. In our text from the Gospel of John, we encounter raw human grief and loss. We are people all too familiar with the grief-filled reality of death. When earthquakes, tsunamis, and hurricanes hit our earth, we are surrounded by headlines reporting the amount of lives lost in mere moments. This is a reality we are also facing in this COVID-19 season, where a worldwide count of lives taken by the virus gets updated hourly. But death is not something we experience only at a distance through news headlines. An unfortunate fact of our earthly human life is that we have all been touched by death at some point. The death of a loved one can impact us to a point of wordless grief. We might weep, we might ask questions, we might cry out to God, wondering why these painful things must happen in the first place. This is where Mary and Martha are at when we encounter them in our text today. But before Lazarus dies, our text tells us that Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus. 
They want Jesus to know that their beloved brother and his own friend, Lazarus, is sick. They no doubt want this message to get to Jesus as soon as possible, in hopes that he can get there to work a miracle and save them from the pain of losing their brother. But when Jesus receives this news, he doesn't react how we might like. We are told that he stays where he is for two days. Two whole days! We might like Jesus to drop everything he is doing so that he can be there for Lazarus and his sisters. After all, they would be traveling by foot, so time is critical. But Jesus doesn't immediately drop everything and go. Only two days after receiving the news does Jesus finally say to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. This announcement of their departure instills fear into the disciples. They try to talk him out of going, remembering previous experiences that are clearly still haunting them. They clarify with Jesus, reminding him that only a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone him, and yet he is going back? They seem to be in disbelief that this is even a conversation they are having with Jesus to begin with. In fact, the disciples are so afraid to embark on this journey that even when it is decided that Jesus is going, Thomas invites the disciples by saying, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Worst case scenario was certainly on the minds of the disciples, as though they were anticipating an angry mob greeting them upon their arrival in Bethany. Nonetheless, they all embark on this journey together. But by the time they arrive in Bethany, Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days, and it would seem that Jesus' delay and arriving has only intensified the pain of Mary and Martha. Only Martha goes to meet Jesus when she heard he was coming, while Mary stayed at home filled with sorrow. When Martha finally sees Jesus, she is overcome with anger and perhaps even accusation. She cries out, Well, there you are. It's about time. This whole thing could have been avoided if you had have just shown up when we first called you. I know you could have healed Lazarus just like you've done for so many other people before. These sisters are filled with understandable grief, disappointment, and agony with the loss of their brother. Jesus responds to Martha's grief and distress with a promise. He tells Martha that her brother will rise again. When he says this, Martha immediately assures Je Jesus that she knows about the promised resurrection of all at the end of time. But in this instance, Jesus isn't talking about the promised resurrection at the end of time. Instead, he is talking about something more immediate. It is as if he is trying to show that the life he offers is not merely a promise reserved for the end times, but something that makes a difference here and now. In her grief, Jesus affirms to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha indeed believes this. She affirms Jesus' identity by professing, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After their exchange, Martha goes to collect her sister Mary. 
when Mary first lays eyes on Jesus, she is overcome with sorrow and falls at his feet. Mary follows Martha's earlier line of accusation, as she also says to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Their grief is engulfing as these poor women are consumed with the pain of losing their brother. And by now, Jesus himself is so overcome with grief and pain that he is deeply moved in spirit and troubled. In fact, Jesus is so moved that we are told in the shortest verse of the Bible that he wept. Here we catch a glimpse of Jesus' humanity. This makes even the people around Jesus realize just how much he loved his friend Lazarus. But Jesus is not weeping here because he has forgotten that in just a few minutes, his buddy Lazarus will be back from the dead. No, Jesus weeps because he knows this isn't how it is supposed to be. He who made the world and everything in it knows that this world was not supposed to be filled with darkness, pain, and sorrow. Jesus weeps for the state of this world because he adores this world and he loves the people in it that must bear the pain. Seeing Jesus' own sorrowful reaction, the people around him are filled with questions. In their bewilderment, they wonder, could not he, who opened the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man from dying? Not only are the sisters disappointed, but so too is the crowd that gathered around them at the tomb. They seem to think that if only Jesus cared more, and if only he had have come sooner, then this crisis could have all been avoided. But in the midst of this crowd's sorrow, disappointment, and doubt, Jesus surprises them all with a miracle. They gather at the tomb where Lazarus had been laid. Jesus orders them to roll away the stone at the entrance of the tomb. At this request, Martha protests, By this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there for four days. But Jesus reminds her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? In their belief, the people all gather around and follow Jesus' instruction, curious as to what he has in store. When the stone is rolled away, Jesus looks up and says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Then the miracle Jesus had promised Martha earlier in the story comes true. After giving thanks to God, Jesus says, Lazarus, come out! At once, we are told that Lazarus indeed comes out of the tomb with his hands and feet still wrapped in strips of linen and cloth around his face. As Lazarus emerges from the tomb, I am struck by Jesus' command. Jesus says to the people witnessing the miracle, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Jesus invites all the people around him to participate in this miracle. Jesus didn't have to do this. He could have left himself in the limelight, unwrapped Lazarus himself, and greeted him with a hug as he welcomed his friend back from the dead. After all, Jesus wept for this very man, but this is not what Jesus chooses to do. Instead, he invites those around him to get involved and play a part in seeing this miracle move forward. Now we might want to know exactly what happens next 
as Mary and Martha observe this miracle and see their brother Lazarus emerge from the tomb after being buried there for four days. Were they shocked? Was Lazarus fearful as he emerged? Did they throw him a party to welcome him back to life? The text does not give us a play-by-play of Lazarus being greeted by Jesus, Mary, Martha, and the others that had gathered to witness this miracle. Instead, the gospel writer ends the story by telling us that many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. How could you not believe after witnessing Jesus resurrect a man from the dead right before their very eyes. And yet we will see, as we move closer to Easter, that this event did not deepen the faith of all. In fact, it deepened opposition of many. But because we stand at a privileged point in history, and we know the end of the story, we are left to marvel over what an incredible God we serve, a God of resurrection and new life. This miracle reveals to us the character and commitment of God to us, God's very own children. This text serves as an example that God does not only do miracles, but he invites us to participate in these very miracles extending their impact and drawing others into the new reality that they create. We are not called to just observe God at work in our lives. Rather, we are called to be changed by what we witness. We are invited into the ongoing reality of what God is doing in this world. Yes, it is God who brings the miracles into fruition, but he gives us a part to play as these uh, miracles unfold in our life and in our world around us. This story includes immense heartache, not just with the death, death of Lazarus, but with the delay of Jesus. As we consider the context we are living in right now, with the COVID-19 crisis persisting around us, we too might be waiting and praying for a miracle from Jesus. Even though we know he knows, just like Mary and Martha, we continue to pray to God, petitioning for the end of the spread of this virus so that life can go back to our version of normal. But as the virus persists, and we continue to live through a time of social distancing and self-isolation, our sorrow and pain might be increasing like Mary and Martha. Our pain might be growing as we continue to suffer amidst this disruptive crisis that is causing anxiety and fear. We too might be disappointed that God's response seems to us to be delayed. And yet, our text today serves as proof that God is moving and working in our world. He does have a plan unfolding, despite the sorrow, pain, fear, and anxiety that continues to build around us. Now, no, things don't happen how or when we would like. In a world where there is so much available to us on demand, this can be difficult for us to accept. But God works in God's own ways and on God's own time, and we must trust the process. In the meantime, we accept the life that Jesus offers because it makes a difference here and now. We are invited into the ongoing work of the one who is the resurrection and the life. We are invited to see past what we perceive to be a delayed response from Jesus to the miraculous hope 
and trust that he offers to each of us. The season of Lent is a time of waiting. We are perhaps waiting for more than we bargained for this Lenten season as we pray for the end of this viral crisis that we are currently living through. But my friends, God is not done yet. Jesus' enemies tried to prevent any future miracles or resurrections by burying the one doing the work. But we know that that didn't work, so nor will a virus keep God from his miraculous, redemptive work in this world. And so, my friends, I want to thank you for tuning in and joining me as we consider this text from the Gospel of John today, and as we remember that even though it seems like God's response to us is delayed, he is still working in the world. He still has a plan for each and every one of us, because he created us, and he loves us, and he cares for us. And before you go, I want to encourage you to keep on watching our YouTube channel as we are hoping to continue uploading a time of prayer each week around Wednesday. And I also want to encourage you to keep an eye out on your inbox and also our Facebook page as we will be circulating a newsletter next week. And in our newsletter this month, we will be featuring some links to resources that you might find helpful during this time of social distancing. And my friends, as we continue through this time of social distancing, I am continuing to uphold you all in prayer during these very uncertain times. God has promised to be with us every day through both the good and the bad. And so may we trust that God is holding our world in his hands. May we know that he is giving us strength and wisdom as we discern how to help those around us during this time of crisis. And as we trust together that God will respond to this world's needs in his own ways and on his own time, it is my prayer that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit will be with each of you this day and forevermore. Amen.